Okay, we're getting ready to get started. Um, the only announcement that I wanted to make is that we do have a party tonight from 6 o'clock to 8 o'clock. It's held next door in the Marriott in their bar, the Champion Bar. Super easy to get to. Walk straight out of the Hilton Hotel, walk right a block, and it's right there in the Marriott. So, but the only catch is to get in, you have to either wear or bring your puppet shirt or one of the stickers. Um, that's just to prevent party crashers. <laughs> um, with that, I will turn it over to Patrick. He's going to talk about hierarchical systems and policy. Po I can't even talk at this point. <laughs> policy <laughs> management. All right. <coughs> Hi, everybody. I'm uh, Patrick Paul. We are at Puppet Camp, that close to the ocean, and um, this is hierarchical systems policy management in a puppet LDAP environment. Um, towards the end of the presentation, I'm sure that that sentence will make more sense to everyone. Okay. So, going forward. The format I'm going to have is the then, which will be the design inspiration for the uh, work done with Puppet and LDAP. Uh, the now, uh, taking those same methods, uh, applying them to Puppet, and the how, how it was implemented, some of the nuts and bolts. Um, much of the nuts and bolts, the really deep down stuff, well, we can save for the Q&A. <coughs> All right, getting started. Uh, what came before? So uh, as any talk at a Linux conference discussing Puppet should start, we're going to start with Windows and Active Directory. Um, about a decade ago when I was working at MIT, um, I was in responsible for an Active Directory domain and I worked with the WinAthena team at MIT, which was the Active Directory campus-wide implementation. Um, Active Directory has many components, LDAP is one of them, Kerberos is one of them, MIT invented Kerberos, so the fact that Active Directory and uh, Windows was at MIT, a traditional Unix environment, uh, made more sense uh, knowing that. Uh, Active Directory has objects stored in an LDAP tree. We'll uh, discuss a little bit what an LDAP tree is, uh, but uh, suffice it to say that computer objects in Active Directory are stored in an LDAP tree and nowhere else. Then you have a policies that apply to the computer objects. Um, we're going to structure that in a specific format, and this next graphic is going to be about the worst graphic I have, so please bear with me. It's very dense but it illustrates what a, uh, um, what a hierarchical policy with LDAP is in an Active Directory sense. So if you have your root level domain, uh, consider that A, root level domain of A, anything under that is B, so you have one B. As you can see, you have two Cs. I really should have had uh, a C graphic and a C graphic broken out. But as you can see, if you go down the, um, the, the tree, you have your A level, B level, C level, D level, E level, another E level, and on and on and on. Uh, and that is basically LDAP. An LDAP tree looks like that, and um, Active Directory, this specific tool in Active Directory, uh, just shows you the LDAP tree, and it shows you where your group policies are. Um, now, for example, if you were to take a computer object and place it right here, what you'll see is because of the hierarchical inheritance of uh, Active Directory, that this policy applies, and that makes sense because that policy is associated with E, if you go up the tree, you'll see that comp app locker and comp default policies associated with those right there also flow. So if you go up the tree, you'll see that E, then D, there's nothing on D, there's nothing on C, so we go up to B. Did I screw that up? Oh, point at D. Okay. Yeah, you're right. Sorry about that. Yeah, so we see that at D we have these policies. And then all the way at the top we have the um, default domain policy. So we see just by having computer live in that OU, an organizational unit, um, you have all these, all these policies automatically applied. And it's a great way to really manage your systems because at a glance you can just see what uh, you have, what's being applied, and then um, you know, why it's being applied. If it's being applied directly to the systems or, it's being directly, or if it's being inherited from above. So enough of Windows, let's introduce Puppet. So Puppet is to me, policies defined with puppet classes. Um, just like you have group policy in Windows uh, applying to your systems, these are policies that you define and they're called puppet classes. Um, it's mentioned right there explicitly. Um, you know, I think we've all worked with puppet classes. That's just an example of a puppet class. I don't know how it shows up here. Um, yeah, the image doesn't even show up, but that's uh, just a screen grab of a policy 
starting to, uh, it was a Tomcat policy in this place. It, the graphic just doesn't show up, unfortunately. Um, that's just, uh, you know, a, I am looking at maybe 10 lines of a .pp file. So this is just that graphic. Um, the more defined types you have in an environment, the more classes you need, and that just makes sense. Uh, if you have a defined type that says you are a web server, you're going to have different classes than if you have a defined type saying you are a database. Um, you know, this is uh, this is just a simple find operation of uh, the amount of classes that we actually have in use right now. And I'm working with 187 classes. And granted, some of them are very specific and only apply to a few. But managing those 187 classes, applying it to hundreds of systems, you're really looking at um, quite a headache. And you know, these are all classes um, I've worked with. Some of you have probably worked with also. Um, there's other classes that exist uh, that um, you know I haven't uh, implemented, I haven't used. Um, but you know, if you have a Hadoop environment, if you have an ActiveMQ server, if you have uh, you know your JVM settings, all of those need to be defined somewhere, and they're defined in a class. So if you have all these classes with Puppet, the problem becomes associating the classes with the servers. Now, you can use your site PP node.pp, um, where you can do something like that. Um, that uh, that's how a lot of people start off. That's how I started off. Uh, you can then just do a default all systems get a specific set of policies. Um, problem with that is then that you are looking at managing these files on a regular basis just to add a system. Um, I'll discuss that a little bit more later. Uh, another way you can associate classes with servers or is an external node classifier. And this is straight from Puppet. Um, I looked into that also uh, as a way in order to associate systems with classes, but the uh, uh, problem with that was it wasn't as easy as LDAP, which once I found out about LDAP, I uh, started using, and uh, everything about LDAP can be discussed here, how to set it up, how to implement it. So with Puppet and LDAP, uh, you have the ability to do anything programmatically. You can script against your uh, LDAP tree. Uh, you can do a great amount of things. But if you just want to go in and add one specific server, um, do a little bit of work, uh, Apache LDAP browser makes it very easy. Um, that's a component, uh, that's a plugin that you can add to Eclipse. Uh, you can have it standalone. It's just a graphical LDAP uh, browser, and it lets you do um, a great deal of management uh, straight from a GUI, which you know is not ideal in many places, but um, I enjoy it because you know a picture is worth a thousand words when you're dealing with all sorts of systems and policies. Okay, um, I feel manually applying classes to servers is painful, which is why the previous two entries, uh, previous two ways of managing or of associating classes with systems, uh, which is modifying your sites.pp or nodes.pp file, and also your external nodes classifier, is every time you add a system, you kind of have to do one other thing. I, I don't like doing that one other thing, so I, I had it set up so that it only only by adding a system to LDAP does everything automatically flow down. Um, also, implementing logic to automatically apply classes, if that's what you do, um, is also painful to me. Um, you can envision your sites.pp that has some programmatic language that says, if hostname contains this string, then apply this class. Then if you need to uh, create a new class of systems, you have to modify your logic so that it does another check for this type. So anytime you extend, you kind of have to go back and modify uh, your programmatic um, functions. Um, now with LDAP, instead of doing any work, you can make class association intrinsic and inherited. It's intrinsic because the classes are based on where the object lives. As we saw with Active Directory, and we'll see in a second with um, the tool I created, um, a system lives somewhere, and by definition, it, in, it has all um, its classes associated with it. Um, intrinsically, it just is. One equals the other, x equal x. Uh, it's inherited because uh, everything that applies to it comes from its level and above and above all the way to the root. Okay. Um, da -da -da. Uh, my tool uh, that I created was about a 400 line Perl script that duplicates the functionality of uh, Active Directory. And I'll show you how it duplicates it. So this is a live LDAP tree um, using Apache uh, LDAP, uh, what is it? LDAP browser. 
Uh, instead of having um, instead of having group policy names here and here and here, um, the script looks for keywords. Uh, sorry, the script looks for a specific common name of CN equal puppet classes. So I'll show you what that means. So if you click on that, you'll see that that object has those two puppet class attributes associated with it, basic basic and basic M collective. What that means is every single system in the entire environment gets those two classes and what those two classes are, you know, it's just you know, your basic.pp, your M collective.pp, and uh, you define what they do. Next on down, um, you might have, for example, a Tomcat OU, and Tomcat specifies a puppet class of Tomcat 6, Tomcat 6. That's just the name of it, and it, it installs Tomcat. Um, it doesn't include on Java, making sure that that's installed. Um, you have further down the tree of transcoder um, at the media platform, uh, where a uh, we we have a great need for video transcoding, and this is the class that installs the binaries for the actual transcoding. And then one uh, level further down, you'll see that under transcoder you have different ones: dev, QA, prod. Under prod, you have a CN puppet classes that uh, specify um, four further classes, and those further classes um, just differentiate a prod system from a QA system. So if you were to look at it, um, your prod prompt, your S3FS transcoder prod, um, right there, those two, the puppet class, Tomcat 6 transcoder prod and transcoder transcoder prod, um, in a QA environment, those classes would be underscore QA instead of underscore prod. Now. If you then go down to this system here, as an example system, all those classes are associated with the object in LDAP, and they come from all the places up here. So that is uh, how uh, this tool simulates Active Directory. Um, all the classes automatically flow down and apply to the class based on everything above it. Okay, um, the puppet hierarchify.pl script, what it does is anytime it, sorry, anytime it applies a, a policy, a puppet class to a system, it also applies an info attribute of the same name. Um, that way it can differentiate between a class that puppet hierarchify is, uh, applied and a manual class. And to sum that up really, is that if I wanted to manually associate a class with the system, I still could. Um, and the way Puppet Hierarchify would know that I manually applied it versus it manually, it automatically applied it, would be that there's no corresponding info attribute. Okay, I find it easy to use. Uh, it's you know clearly a little bit, uh, uh, a little bit to wrap your head around in terms of shifting to this new hierarchical model. Um, but I found you know for me once I once I was sorry. Based on what I had used previously, this came most easy to me. Uh, it's a graphical tool for easy in, easy out work. Um, one of the features is, is if you move an object from one uh, leaf on, an, on LDAP to another, the script will automatically um, disassociate those previous classes and associate the new class of the system. So for example, if we were to migrate from Tomcat 6 to Tomcat 7, uh, we would move the computer object from the Tomcat 6 at 6 tree over to the Tomcat 7 tree. The Tomcat 6 classes would disassociate, would disassociate the Tomcat 7 classes would associate, and the system would um, now be a Tomcat 7 system. Um, you'll find in many development shops where if you're working with application servers, Glassfish, Tomcat, etc., uh, you'll find that you have a common code base, um, the application.war that gets generated, um, can run many different roles, meaning the same exact war on one system with specific properties ha runs uh, a specific uh, uh, set of functions, runs a different code base, sorry, um, executes a different code path, uh, it runs a different role. If you then have different attributes or different properties on that same war, it will run a different role. So one example I have in the past is the same code base if you run it with these properties it's a fetcher where it just scrapes the internet. Um, another one, if you associate it with the different properties, um, the same war will then be a, uh, a JSON endpoint for a PHP front end. So to do that graphically, I mean, using this tool, you can do that graphically. Um, you can also do it programmatically. 
but being able to see that you created a new role was as easy as just creating a new OU, um, specify new CN equal public classes values, and then uh, the, any servers you put in there automatically inherit the new classes. Uh, one of the other good things about um, using this method is you can have different administrators manage different sets of systems. Um, this is the same in Active Directory in that at the root of your uh, domain, you have specific policies and then maybe only global administrators can modify those policies. Further down, you might have departments or you might have uh, you know, labs, you might have uh, you know, different, uh, you know, uh, different corporate structures in which one OU is managed by one set of people and another OU is managed by another set of people. What that would mean is all the corporate-wide uh, policies uh, would be applied to all systems and then the local administrators would be able to specify the local classes that um, add functionality. Uh, and that is, um, uh, that's, not, uh, that's not as easy to implement, I found, uh, with OpenLDAP, which is the LDAP server backend that um, is currently in use. But any LDAP server could be used, and other LDAP servers have much better authentication and permissioning models that would let them um, easily uh, enable this. I haven't enabled it, but it is uh, possible. Okay, um, now we have discussed, or I have discussed, the uh, way in which you can associate classes with servers using LDAP and some tools. Um, that's good and all, but how do you go from the system uh, first starting all the way into a fully managed environment? If you're talking about bare metal, uh, using this type of environment. You'll want to add your DHCP DNS entries before the system boots. Uh, then you pixie boot the server like normal, you install the OS, and one of the uh, install OS functions would be install Puppet. Uh, and then that's it, Puppet takes from there. Puppet would contact the Puppet server, find out what classes are apply to it, and then uh, take it from a bare OS to a fully managed system. That's what I've done in the past. For EC2, um, what I do is I prefer to use no, I didn't close that parentheses. I prefer to use unmodified vendor AMIs, meaning the Ubuntu native, uh, not native, the Ubuntu unmodified AMI, the CentOS unmodified AMI. Um, this is opposed to spinning up an AMI, modifying it, shutting it down, and having that then be your AMI, which you use to launch further systems. Um, uh, that's what I have used. Uh, that's implemented via a user data bash script when you're uh, instantiating your uh, new system. Uh, if you specify, uh, you know, the, the user data um, with Ubuntu and CentOS, um, what will happen is when those AMIs first boot, they'll look at the u their user data properties in, uh, in EC2. And if it starts with slash bin slash bash or bin sh or whatever, it'll actually execute the script. And the script on uh, the script as we implement it um, basically uh, installs Puppet, sets the domain name, and that's it. So it's very easy uh, to implement. And um, the amount of work it takes to get the system from bare metal or um, AMI to Puppet is very small, and then Puppet does all the rest. One of the things that, can, uh, that came up is uh, how, to prevent, uh, how to prevent the need to uh, sign each server when it boots up. Now you can throw something in autosign.conf. Um, you can put, a, I think, a star in there, which would autosign everything. I don't like that at all. So uh, an additional cron job runs, which queries LDAP, finds all instances uh, that are added that are not in autosign, and then adds them to autosign.conf. So when the system does start Puppet a few minutes later, um, it just automatically signs the certificate and Puppet. Um, it, it then is no longer, uh, there's, there's no need for a manual process at that point. Okay. Uh, this is uh, some of Puppet Hierarchify.pl. Um, it's, like I said, maybe 400 lines of code. All it does is for every object in LDAP, it goes up to the root, it finds all CN equal puppet classes uh, objects, finds all the puppet class attributes, sees if those attributes are already applied to the uh, computer object, applies them if they're not. Um, you know, with all the documentation, I mean with all the commenting 
and uh, bad coding. I'd say it's a, a solid hundred lines of code, but it's you know a 400 line script. Um, one of the next steps that um, I'm going to be working on shortly is just like you have your puppet class uh, able to inherit values, I want to make puppet bars inheritable. Um, reason for that is if, for example, you have a puppet bar of Nagios check equals Tomcat 6, what that'll do is then um, if you apply that, uh, just like if you apply a CN equal puppet classes value uh, at a level in the tree, any systems below it automatically get that. I want to have puppet bars when you specify um, CN equal puppet bars. Um, I'll figure out exactly how, uh, what object to store it in. Um, but I want to have uh, specific puppet bars inherit down to the system. That way you can specify um, that you have a Tomcat 6 check that you want to apply in Nagios. You have maybe a basic uh, you know, port 80 web check. You might have an SSL check. You might have a bunch of checks applied to a system. So if you uh, put, a uh, put an object into LDAP and all of these puppet bar values automatically inherit down to the system, that means then that you can on your Nagios server just do a simple script which would query LDAP, uh, find all computer objects, uh, and then automatically um, associate all puppet bar Nagios check equal values with uh, something on the local system. And what that means is, is if the script is looking for Nagios check equals something and it gets a Tomcat 6 in return, then the script would just look into, uh, it would look in a certain folder um, for a file called Tomcat 6 and then any checks in that file would automatically be applied in Nagios to that system. Um, so that is uh, the automatic way of doing it, and it's not any different from the manual way of doing it, in which you have a new system, you want to apply a bunch of checks to it in Nagios, you have to manually specify what checks to apply. So this is uh, a way that you can save a lot of time uh, doing that. Um, another thing that could be implemented down the line is inheritance blocking. Um, I haven't implemented it, but what you could do is have maybe a third level OU have a um, a block attribute enabled, which means that um, none of the above classes or the parent classes would trickle down to it. Um, and that's good for testing and stuff. So if you wanted to create a new OU that had nothing on it, including your basic basic, um, then you'd create a new OU, specify these classes, and turn on the block inheritance uh, attribute. That's not implemented, but it, it could be easily implemented in uh, the Perl script. Okay. Um, there's some thanks in Q&A. Uh, I'd love to get into the nuts and bolts a little bit. Uh, my employer, Media Platform, mediaplatform.com. We are currently hiring for a Puppet DevOps person and a QA lead. Uh, I'd like to thank Puppet Labs. Uh, when I first moved out to California, um, I had worked with CF Engine before, and I know CF Engine is here at scale. I, I didn't like it too much. It was kind of a pain to use, and Puppet was so much easier. Um, scale, i definitely like to thank. Um, neat conference. I guess I haven't heard of it before. Uh, it definitely will be showing up next year. And then, um, you know, questions and answers. I kind of went through it pretty quickly, um, but then again, I didn't know what specific uh, parts there uh, I'd need to dive into uh, in greater detail. Oh, sure. Uh, from the schema changes. Okay, that is on the uh, the puppet site. Um, basically, you have to do a single file, I think, include a puppet.schema. Um, it might be, I think there's only a few attributes, puppet var, puppet class. Um, I think it's, it's, it's rather small. It's much smaller than like an, not an X509, but it's much smaller than a, uh, a other uh, schema extensions that I've had to do. Okay. It's also dependent on the puppet hierarchy file script. Yeah. Um, okay, in this implementation, um, the way Puppet works uh, when talking to LDAP is you specify your uh, node classifier. No, no, not, not your node classifier. Your terminus. Uh, I can't remember the exact uh, terminology. But it's in your puppet.conf. You specify that you're going to use LDAP, and that's it. You specify just LDAP. You specify your server. You specify what uh, OU it lives in, and then perhaps authentication parameters. Um, 
and what happens is Puppet doesn't know about Puppet. The uh, Puppet doesn't know about the script. The Puppet Master contacts LDAP, says, "Hey, I got a system. It's uh, its name is Bob. Um, what classes are associated with Bob?" Now, uh, the script, all the script does is apply all those classes to the object Bob. Um, Puppet Master doesn't know about the script. Puppet Master doesn't care about the script. It's just a way to uh, assign classes to objects because then Puppet retrieves those classes from LDAP. Puppet DB? Okay. okay. Um, yeah, I'm not familiar with Puppet DB. So which system exactly is running the script? Is it the LDAP server? Um, it could be any system. Um, it's uh, at the uh, the top of the script. Uh, you have your parameters, your server name, your authentication parameters. So in uh, in this environment, I have it running on the shared LDAP Puppet server. In previous environments, it just ran on the LDAP server, you can actually have it run on any server as long as it can contact the LDAP server. So the, the script doesn't know about Puppet so much as it knows about computer objects and associating attributes to those computer objects, which just happen to be the right attributes for Puppet. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah, it runs every minute. Um, I had it previously set lower, but um, EC2 AMIs tend to boot kind of fast. So if I have it run every three minutes, I might Puppet might actually start before all the objects, uh, before all the Puppet classes are associated with the new um, uh, computer object I just created. Um, it gets it from the special object called CN equal puppet classes. In, in every CN equal puppet classes in LDAP, there are puppet classes. So it just walks the tree, grabs the classes, and applies it or uh, unapplies it based on uh, what's already, <coughs> on this, uh, already on the object. And all of that information about the class is stored on the object? Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, it's just a standard um, puppet class attribute, yeah standard text. Uh, you have uh, um, you have your object and then you have your attribute puppet class and then you have your va value in Tomcat 6, um, Java, it doesn't matter. And then all of the objects, sorry, all of the attribute values are then applied to the local system. So it's just really a way of combining all that lives above onto the existing system so that you don't have to. Oh no no oh, okay. yeah like, wow. yeah no it's a, it's a standard way of having uh, it's a standard LDAP way. Um, if I were to manually apply all of these classes to systems, then I wouldn't need the script. And Puppet would just natively uh, query LDAP, find the computer object, find the classes associated with it, and then you know do the normal parsing of the local um, you know SC Puppet modules uh, directory structure. So the script is really just dealing with the inheritance. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, um, I could rename it to Puppet Inherit Inheritify <laughs> Puppet Inheritance, um, but Hierarchify. Um, if you don't practice spelling those tough words, you forget how. So I Hierarchify is a lot different. Okay. Um, one uh, one further uh, follow up is um, you know uh, let me think. putting this code onto something like Git so other people could use it, or uh, sorry, GitHub. I'd have to clean it up a little, but I'm not going to spend too much time cleaning it up because uh, over the years I've learned more and more Ruby because, I mean, that's how you extend Puppet and make it work better. Uh, so it, this is something that could really be implemented in Ruby. The fact that it's um, written in Perl is just uh, what I was familiar with at the time. So, uh, you know, soon enough, I guess I'll uh, throw it up onto uh, GitHub and uh, wait for the uh, flack about my coding to uh, you know, <laughs> commence. I don't know. I, I do. I'm I'm not a programmer. I uh, I learned it. Um, I, I can use it. It took like two weeks to write that. Uh, uh, you know, one script, and uh, every time I have to modify it, it takes about six hours, just because it's you know the 
uh, you know, I'm not thinking like that all the time. <laughs> okay, um, thank you everyone. Uh, you know, I, I do feel like I rushed through things, but um, the slide will be available online uh, shortly, and, and the PDF will be available online shortly, and the code for everyone to look at, and uh, you know, I find personally looking at the code really does help me understand what's going on, so maybe the same will be, uh, same will apply to everyone else.